go spectacular when Michael and Dominique take to the skies. Friday at 6.30 on Channel 9. Chicago's very own 9 o'clock news. Milwaukee residents stocking up on bottled water after thousands there get sick, possibly from drinking the municipal water. Good evening, I'm Rick Rosenthal. And I'm Allison Payne. Milwaukee is under a boil order tonight as officials try to determine the source of a flu-like illness. The order has businesses scrambling to keep up with the demand for drinking water. But as Muriel Claire reports, the problem did not develop overnight. For days, residents of Milwaukee and its suburbs have been feeling under the weather. At first, most thought they were suffering from a bad bout of the flu. Well, I've had uh, flu-type symptoms for over a week with severe diarrhea, vomiting, stomach cramps. And uh, the more I went to the bathroom, the more I drank the water. Drinking the water may have been the wrong thing to do. City officials say they aren't 100% certain, but it's a good chance the water supply may be infected with cryptosporidium, a microorganism commonly found in the gut of animals. The parasite may have been in farmland runoff that found its way into Milwaukee's water supply. There's a lot of runoff that comes into the river from upstream and, uh, and during periods of uh, rainfall and, uh, and heavy runoff, and that, that, uh, that water uh, enters the uh, the lake at the mouth of the river, which is uh, not too far from our intake. Health officials found up to 23 individuals who tested positive for the organism, and they say they expect to find more. I'm fairly convinced that this has been going on for a couple weeks now, and that uh, there has certainly been hundreds of people who have come to see uh, their physicians in uh, physicians' offices. Most of the people who have been ill have handled it at home without letting anybody know. Meantime, as soon as the water became suspect, the city issued a boil order, and there was a mad scramble for bottled water. Some stores sold completely out by midday. It's been water. Water, water, water. Everybody's looking for it. It's just a precaution, um, just so I can have coffee in the morning. Otherwise, I'll drink soda, anything, <laughs> anything that didn't come out of the tap. Milwaukee health officials are taking no chances. They say as soon as they finish testing the water supply, they'll shut down the suspect Howard filtration plant for a thorough investigation. So it may be days before Milwaukee residents can take a drink of water from the tap. Muriel Clare, WGN News, Milwaukee. And 800,000 people are affected by that boil order. It also applies to water used to wash food. In addition to water, several stores are selling out of over-the-counter flu remedies. All right, we both get our water supplies from the same source. Milwaukee and Chicago get their water from Lake Michigan. How are we faring? Officials here tonight are assuring residents in this area that our drinking water is completely safe. For one thing, officials at Chicago's water filtration facilities say rivers and streams in this area do not flow into Lake Michigan. In Milwaukee, the Milwaukee and Menominee rivers, which do carry farm waste and runoff, do flow into Lake Michigan. Chicago officials also say the amount of chlorine used to treat our water here is three times the federal standard and has been increased even more as a precaution because of Milwaukee's problem. Chicago officials say they are able to test water on site at both plants here and do regularly. Milwaukee, they say, cannot. In other news tonight, Chicago police hunting for the ski masked gunman who shot and killed a Southside mother of four. 49-year-old Barbara Sturgis was gunned down early this morning as she sat in a car parked outside her Englewood home. Her son says her niece had just stopped by to pick her up to go to work. It was something they did almost every morning. This morning, the early calm was shattered by gunfire. They got in the car and someone shot down the block and then ran up to her, ran up to the car on the passenger side and opened up the door and shot at point blank range. That was the victim woman's son. The woman's niece was also wounded, not seriously. Police believe the Sturgis woman was the gunman's intended target, that this was no random act of violence. If they have a motive, tonight they have not yet revealed it. LaPorte police say they have put in many hours and are growing tired, but they're not giving up on the search for 16-year-old Raina Risen. Risen has been missing for two weeks now. Tim Jackson has an update on the effort to find her. LaPorte police met with reporters Thursday morning to publicly show Raina's letter jacket for the first time since it was recovered last Saturday from a dump site. 
any sign of struggle or anything like that? No, as I stated the other day, there was no sign of a struggle. The recovery of the jacket was possible due in part to the numbers of tips and phone calls coming into the department on a daily basis. The other day, we probably uh, received another 200 calls, uh, people, uh, possible sightings, uh, things that might help uh, locate Raina, and we try and check down uh, every tip that comes uh, through the telephone. The possible sightings are now coming in from across the country, but so far not one has turned into a hard lead. Psychics are also working on the case, but when pressed, police admit they have absolutely no new leads in this case. We're, like I said, we're going to uh, push forward and uh, do what we have to, and as we get these tips, uh, we'll follow them out and make sure there's nothing connected with Raina. Meanwhile, Chief Gene Samuelson is eager to receive the results of FBI test samples from Raina's car and her jacket. He remains hopeful. Uh, we hope, you know, we can find her somewhere, uh, just some indication where she is. The chief says the nationally syndicated TV crime reenactment show, America's Most Wanted, plans to follow up and do a second story on Raina's disappearance in the near future. He hopes that publicity will help generate new leads in this baffling case. Tim Jackson, WGN News. A reward for Raina Risen's safe return was raised today to $36,000. A reading teacher charged with sexually assaulting one of his pupils at a West Side school is out on bond tonight. 42-year-old Robert Rouse is accused of fondling a 7-year-old boy. He was released early this morning on $15,000 bond. The boy was one of Rouse's reading pupils at Chopin Elementary School. Rouse is charged with one count of aggravated criminal sexual abuse and an investigation is underway to determine if other pupils were involved. Police say the 23-year-old veteran teacher has no criminal record. He has been ordered not to have unsupervised contact with children. In California, closing arguments began today in the federal civil rights trial of four Los Angeles police officers accused in the Rodney King beating incident. The prosecution summed up its case in about three hours and the defense then began its laborious summation. More on this story now from Linda Joyce reporting from Los Angeles. Prosecutor Stephen Clymer held the jury spellbound during closing arguments Thursday, calling the defense's position full of lies, exaggeration, concealment, and deception. Clymer said King was drunk and disrespectful and tried to run away, and that's why the officers beat him. After playing the original version of the amateur videotape, Clymer called on the jury to answer the question, who was in control, Rodney King or the police officers? The defense argued King resisted arrest, causing the officers to use force to control him. Sergeant Stacy Kuhn, the only defendant to testify, told the court the beating was within LAPD guidelines. Defense attorney Harlan Braun praised the prosecutor's efforts, but told reporters, when it's the defense's turn, they'll have answers for every point. It was a good presentation basically on a weak case, and it was the best that could have been done. But he failed to distinguish between the officers, and the entire prosecution in this case has failed because it has stretched itself too thin. The four officers faced charges they denied King's civil rights. Officers Lawrence Powell, Theodore Bersigno, and Timothy Wind are charged with intentional use of unreasonable force. Their supervisor, Sergeant Stacy Kuhn, faces a different count, allowing an unlawful assault to occur. Prosecutors must prove King suffered bodily harm, but more difficult for the government will be to prove that the officers used unreasonable force or aided and assisted in the use of unreasonable force, and that the beating was intentional. The, the first of four defense attorneys told the court the government failed to prove that when the officers beat King, Sergeant Stacy Kuhn knew they were doing wrong, but intended for them to do so. In Los Angeles, Linda Joyce, WGN News. The three remaining defense attorneys will make their presentations tomorrow. The case could go to the jury late in the day tomorrow or perhaps Saturday. And still to come on the 9 o'clock news, a look at how President Clinton plans to spend the nation's money next fiscal year. And tough times are apparently on the way for hundreds of Chicago's health care workers. We'll take a tour of Chicago's freight tunnel system just a year after the river poured in in that great loop flood. And a little later in sports, things are looking bearish in Augusta following the first round of the Masters Tournament. I'm Tom Skilling in the weather office. It's true. Thunder rumbles across the area for the first time this season and changes ahead of the Easter weekend forecast. We'll have details coming up. Chicago area's largest industries, health care. Rocked by numerous hospital closings in the 1980s, things seemed to have stabilized, but now, as Steve Sanders reports, health care hard times are back. 
Illinois' largest hospital, Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's, is confirming a major restructuring, which could involve big layoffs. The only numbers the hospital is giving out are layoffs that have already taken place. 65 workers let go this week and 100 jobs eliminated. But the lack of specifics is fueling rumors. Rumors that coming layoffs could eventually go as high as 2,000, almost one of every four employees. We won't know anything until it happens, I guess. Uh -huh. You know, we just, you, you hear rumors, but that's about it. Most Rush Presbyterian employees are reluctant to go on camera, and hospital officials have refused our request for an interview. But off camera, they tell us our numbers of 1,800 to 2,000 layoffs are highly exaggerated. Some of those let go this week are nurses, and the organization that represents Illinois nurses says the layoffs are part of an industry-wide trend, which it sees as short-sighted. We're concerned uh, because we have research in a couple of directions that show that RNs with patients uh, are more cost-effective and more um, uh, and safer for the patient's uh, safety and benefit. Just a few months ago, protest demonstrations at the University of Chicago where 350 jobs were eliminated. And now we've learned the University of Illinois Medical Center is getting rid of 150 nursing jobs, all through attrition. That this hospital, like every other hospital, is looking at ways where it can contain costs while maintaining quality of vision, and we've been working very hard since about this time last year to see how we can reduce our costs. Work restructuring is a reasonable, measured way to do that. Well, the U of I Medical Center is also eliminating an unspecified number of support jobs as well. By far, the biggest hospital hit may be aimed at Rush Presbyterian. Employees here are expected to learn more on Monday. Steve Sanders, WGN News. Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's says it will discuss its restructuring plan through a newsletter to be published in the next few days. It's out there now in black and white for all to see. President Clinton's proposed budget for the nation for the new fiscal year. And as WGN's John Abishan reports from Washington, it's a budget that raises taxes on the rich and slashes military spending. It's the fine print for the Clinton agenda. 1,400 pages of it, putting the detail to the spending and taxes plan the president outlined to us in February. Overall spending next year would be about the same as George Bush had proposed, one and a half trillion dollars. The big differences, sharp Pentagon cuts, mostly from taking more than 100,000 people out of uniform, and from higher income taxes on the wealthy and on corporations, and an energy tax on nearly everyone. And for 98% of Americans, their income tax rate will not increase. Not more spending uh, because of the caps, but smarter spending. That is not the way the opposition sees it. It's pretty much what they promised us, more taxes and more spending. But in fact, the administration plan shows a nearly half a trillion dollar cut in the federal deficit over five years. The new spending is mostly just a change in priorities. For example, more job training money. And lifelong learning to allow our workers to adapt to the constantly changing work environment. And a full funding for the Head Start program. A big increase in drug education and prevention money. Stepped up highway and bridge building. Food aid for poor Americans would go up at twice the inflation rate. And this. Immunization for every preschool child. And this budget includes $840 million for immunization. The president still has to come up with another $27 billion in spending cuts to meet caps imposed by Congress. And it won't come from the Pentagon. We've probably uh, gone as far as we're going to go with regards to uh, that category. And as it is, the deficit will start rising again in three years, even under the Clinton plan. Unless, that is, Congress buys the White House health reform package due out next month because medical costs are a huge and growing part of the federal budget. And even there, there will be some new spending because the president promises health insurance to millions of Americans who can't get it now. On Capitol Hill, John Aubuchon, WGN News. In Miami, police have charged two suspects with first-degree murder for last week's brutal killing of a German tourist who ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Barbara Miller Jensen was beaten, robbed, then run over by a car driven by the robbers last Friday night as her mother and children watched. 23-year-old Leroy Rogers charged with murder along with 18-year-old Anthony Williams. Both have extensive criminal records. They were already in custody for unrelated robberies. And now Miami police are promising a crackdown to protect the tourism industry. We like to serve notice 
on those individuals that prey on tourists and that prey on the citizens within this city, that as a result of this arrest and some future arrests, the police department is not going away. We're going to be here, and we will get you. May not get you today or tomorrow, but we're going to get you. That is the Miami chief of police. Seven foreign tourists, including three Germans, have been killed in Florida just this winter alone. Germany and Great Britain have actually issued travel warnings to their citizens about violence in Florida. President Clinton and his family are back in Little Rock tonight, mourning the death of First Lady Hillary Clinton's father. Hugh Rodden, shown here getting off a recent flight, suffered a stroke three weeks ago and died late yesterday at the age of 82. The Roddams lived for years in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, where he worked as a textile company executive. He and his wife Dorothy moved to Little Rock to be closer to Hillary in the late 1980s. Singer Marian Anderson who opened the doors for black performers years before the civil rights movement, died today at the age of 91. The daughters of the American Revolution barred Anderson from appearing at Washington's Constitution Hall in 1939 because of her color, so First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt arranged for her to sing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. That performance focused attention on discrimination in the arts. In 1955, Anderson became the first black to perform at New York's Metropolitan Opera, and she was honored with a Grammy for Lifetime Achievement in 1991. One year ago this month, Chicago's Loop area looked more like a ghost town than a thriving city center. It was a disaster like no other that caused that standstill, a flooding of much of the underground freight tunnel system here. As Roseanne Tejas now reports, numbers on how much the flood cost are now out. The water from flooded loop basements has long ago subsided. Now it's city legal fees that are on the rise. Some businesses forced to close during the flood are suing the city for lost revenue. Even a New York attorney claims he lost profits when the city packed up and went home. Officials say more than 30 lawsuits were filed. But so far they've gone very well. The bulk of the plaintiff's claims have been dismissed by the circuit court. So far, the total cost of the flood cleanup is $30 million. The city's share, including more than a million in legal fees, is $10.8 million. The federal government will pick up $17.3 million, and the state will pay $1.9. Mayor Daley says he still resents the way Governor Edgar dealt with the crisis. In the middle of a crisis, you still don't argue. <laughs> start arguing, well, we're not going to hold your money back or we're not give it to you. I think it was just foolish on the part of the governor. On this one-year anniversary of the flood, Daly invited reporters to tour the freight tunnel system, which he says will now be inspected bi-monthly by a private firm. Even if problems do occur, some 25 new bulkheads, sort of like trap doors, would limit any water buildup. These panels operate the new pumping system, a system intended to handle only minor water seepage. Some rainfall, possibly a leaky sewer or something that feeds the tunnel, small sources that uh, just gradually build up in the low spots of the tunnel, which are underneath the river. And I think we've basically decided and engineered this thing well enough that uh, we, very, I'm very confident it's not ever going to happen again. Roseanne Teus, WGN News. Well, not doubting Mr. Kenny, but just to make sure that it doesn't happen again, the city is developing what it calls a citywide infrastructure management system. Companies will be able to check a computerized map of Chicago streets or an electronic atlas of sewage, water, and utility lines before they start any drilling or digging. Up next, the legends of golf begin their annual quest for the winners of the green jacket at the Masters Tournament. And the Blackhawks battle it out on Long Island while keeping a watchful eye on Detroit. Also, it is not dome sweet dome for the twins. The White Sox keep swinging. And later, shootings by police spark anger in Paris. Cold steel on ice on the front page for sports. You know, you look sharp tonight, too. Why, thank you so very much, <laughs> Allison. And so do you. And Rick? <laughs> Gee, Dan. <laughs> I didn't say anything, Dan. Hey, the Blackhawks, big story tonight. You'd think they'd win the game. They haven't lost a game on Long Island in nine years. It's probably been that long since they needed to win one so badly out there, too. Scratching for that division championship, the Hawks took an early penalty and fell behind 1-0, but they ripped off three goals in a row in the second. Jeremy Roenick set up Jocelyn Lemieux to tie it at one. Then the Hawks get two goals in a 24-second burst. Roenick working in front, shot it in. Shot it in again. The rebound goal put him ahead at 13-19. And at 13-43, the Hawks go back on the attack again. The captain, Dirk Graham, set it up to Christian Rutu to make it 3-1 Chicago. The Islanders scored early in the third, but the Hawks 
Held them off the rest of the way. It is just over, and Chicago a winner by a final score of 3-2. With 99 points now, tied with Detroit for first in the Norris. Uh, the Wings all over Tampa Bay tonight, 9-1. To uh, Toronto is losing, which is good news. 3-2 in the second at Winnipeg. Also in the NHL tonight, Boston leading Quebec in the third. Philadelphia in front of Washington. Well, the White Sox are home from Minneapolis, looking like a bunch of Paul Bunyans after pounding out another win over the Twins this afternoon. The fun started in the second inning, a triple by Lance Johnson, then killer Karkovice stepped up to the dish. The ball hit deep to left center field. Way back. You can't put it on the board. Yes! Number one for Karka. 2-0 White Sox lead, then three more runs in the fourth. Lance Johnson drove in two of his own here. George Bell and Robin Ventura both come in to score, and the Sox were ahead 5-0 after 4. Alex Fernandez, a little wild early, but good after that, asked Pedro Munoz. And then more offense in the seventh inning. Tim Raines jacked one. He has two homers in the first three games. The Sox were up to a 7-2 lead. And finally in the ninth inning, Frank Thomas, who'd gone 0 for 10 for the first time in his career, broke the streak with an RBI single. Sox go on to beat up the Twins 9-4 in the rubber game of that season opening series. So a busy night at the charter terminal at O'Hare. The Bulls waiting to leave for Atlanta, while the Sox can't wait to get home. Some guys haven't seen their families in almost two months. Happy reunions all over the place, and tomorrow the Sox get reacquainted with their home ballpark in the season opener here. It's always uh, gratifying, to, you know, to open at home, even though you start on the road, you know, you don't really get that feeling being on the road, but being at home, you know, when the guys call your name, you hope to hear those tears uh, other than booze when, you, when you're on the road. So I, I'm looking forward to it. I think uh, I definitely will be pumped up. Hopefully I won't be over pumped up, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. Tomorrow afternoon, the Sox and the Yankees in the home opener at Comiskey Park. American League scores tonight. Detroit beat Oakland 3-2. Boston leading Kansas City in the fifth. All kinds of stuff going on in that Cleveland game. Carlos Baerga homered from each side of the plate in the same inning tonight. And that hasn't happened in a long... Well, it's never happened before, as far as that goes. <laughs> a real long time. Other scores, Pittsburgh beat San Diego, and Montreal outslugged Cincinnati 14-11. to Hey, the Masters... Uh, oh, more National League scores first. St. Louis uh, beat San Francisco, and Atlanta leading L.A. in the eighth. That's the home opener for the Braves, too. And now the Masters. It's underway. The best of the major golf tournaments because they play the same awesome course every year. Keeps the memories flowing. Bobby Jones, Gene Sarazen, Arnold, and Jack. 53-year-old Jack Nicklaus, who hasn't won a big tour since the 86 Masters. That's an eagle at 15, got him to four under par. Then at 17, from 15 feet for a birdie and a share of the first round lead right there. The Golden Bear was 67, part of a five-way tie after day one. Also in there, 87 winner Larry Mize. He's a chipping fool when he gets on this course. That's an eagle for him. Yes. And fast finishes today for two of the most popular players out there. Tom Watson at age 43, triple bogey 13, then birdied 15, 16, 17. This was moments ago. And 18. Look at this one. Four in a row for him in a one under par 71. Then John Daly in his second Masters hit two brilliant wedge shots at the last two holes. He almost holed out this one at 18. Daly finished at two under 70 today. Nick Price and Fred Couple 72. Greg Norman and Arnold Palmer both 74. But at the top, it's Nicholas Mize, Corey Pavin, Tom Lehman, and Lee Jansen. Ray Floyd leads a group at 68 after day one at Augusta National. And the Bulls won't like this much. The Knicks beating up Boston tonight, about to take a game and a half lead over Chicago in the East. John Starks having a good night from outside. And a big man doing the job down low. New York was never really in trouble in this game tonight. And the Knicks have won it by a final of 110-88. Detroit by a bucket over Jersey. Brian Shaw has 10 three-point field goals for Miami in that game. That breaks the NBA record. Uh, they're about to win the game there. And much more to come in the update as soon as we figure out what exactly to put on. <laughs> I hear ya. Well, the suspense will be just worth everything. <laughs> just you. ahead, in our report, bringing peace to the streets, it's Easter time, of course, but this bunny comes with a badge.
State health officials are sending out warnings to some parents in northwest suburban Palatine. That's because a 16-year-old student at Fremd High School is critically ill with a case of meningitis. Officials say the student has meningococcal meningitis, which is not highly contagious, but officials want to warn anyone who may have come in contact with that student. Chicago police say they have questioned a south suburban Markham man for the second day in a row today in connection with a series of recent arrow attacks on the city's west side and the south suburbs. At the same time, police say they are not yet ready to consider this man a suspect. A Chicago woman died last Thursday when she was killed with an arrow that went through her heart. Three other women on the west side were injured when shot by arrows in separate incidents, and there were two similar attacks against women in suburban Markham and in Mokina. Our Jim Ramsey is standing by tonight at a sports store in suburban South Suburban Tinley Park, where police questioned the store owner about some hunting equipment that could be involved in the shootings. Jim, what's the latest? Well, Rick, as we understand it, in the course of this investigation, several people have been questioned by police. But for the moment, attention seems to be focused on one man identified only as living in Markham, a man police have questioned for the past two days, and a man also believed to have been a customer here at Freddy Bear Sports. Now, on Wednesday, two police detectives came to the store with an arrow to be examined by the store's owner. Actually, they wanted to know if um, we sold the type of equipment that was used, and they did have some um, evidence with them. And I took a look at it, and uh, it, it is products that we sell. Does that uh, does that surprise you? Are these parts that are that are red readily available around the Chicago area, or are you pretty much an exclusive dealer? Uh, we sell a lot of, uh, of that type of product, but you could buy it at other places too. But one of the things that they showed me, um, I. Th Pretty sure we're the only ones that sell it. We'll continue to closely monitor this investigation, but police remind us that the man now being questioned is not being considered a suspect. Rick and Allison, back to you. All right, Jim, thank you. In tonight's Peace to the Streets segment, a story about cops and kids. Most city youngsters only see the police when there's trouble, but the cops assigned to public housing are trying to change that image. And just in time for the holidays, they pulled Operation Easter Egg today. A nice With break a for the kids, a nice break for the cops. At this party, all the big people are police officers, including the Easter Bunny. We would like to project a very positive image for the Chicago Police Department and get involved with the community policing concept. The officers put this party together. It's their way of doing something fun for the children. I think it's important that they have um, things that other children have, you know, that, that they know who the Easter Bunny is and that they can share in the same thing that other children share in. Some kids made funny faces, but everybody had a good time, including the big kid in the back. Can we find another kid? Yeah, right one. One. There was an Easter egg hunt and a basket for each little one. So, what's the best part about an Easter egg party? Candy. What kind of candy? She promises to sing the whole song next year. For now, happy Easter to all from the cops and the kids at Robert Taylor. And if you know of someone working in your community to bring peace to the streets, we want to hear about them. Write us at 2501 West Bradley Place, Chicago, 60618. Well, adults are also being remembered as Easter approaches. About 850 people stood in today's April rain for an Easter food giveaway at the Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Once inside, each was given a bag filled with food, food which organizers of the giveaway said had been donated by Chicago postal workers. Elgin School District U46, the state's second largest district, will have a new superintendent soon. The board voted last night to hire 49-year-old Marvin Edwards, who has headed the Dallas school system for the past five years. Edwards replaces Superintendent Richard Wiggle, who retires at the end of this school year. But Edwards is no stranger to Illinois. He grew up in Danville and at one time headed the Joliet School District. But coming home means Edwards gives up a larger district and takes a cut in pay, going from a salary of $140,000 to $190,000. $19,000 a year. Overseas, NATO agreed today to enforce a no-fly order over Bosnia against Serbian aircraft. That will begin next Monday. The United States will contribute 12 Air Force jets and 12 Navy fighters to that operation. In the war-torn region itself, another UN convoy evacuated almost 2,000 more Muslim women, children, and old men from the town of Srebrenica to a refugee.
refugee center in Tuzla. The convoy had been blocked earlier by angry Serb civilians who'd complained the UN was helping Muslims and not them. In Paris, an angry clash between police and demonstrators. The confrontation grew out of a protest of the death of a teenager from Zaire, who had been shot and killed by police in an earlier incident. The boy was killed by an officer while being detained on a charge of stealing cigarettes. Police say that shooting was accidental. The young Zairean was the second teenager to be shot and killed by police in Paris in the past week. The violence yesterday left over 50 people hurt. Half of them were police officers. Severe weather making headlines down south where twisters are leaving a trail of destruction. In Louisiana, a tornado smashed through the roof of a high school during classes. One student and two construction workers were killed. At least 20 people were hurt. High winds also flipped about 20 trailers and knocked out electricity and telephone service. Now here in Chicago, we hope we can duck that. The Easter weekend weather outlook still is a mixed one. Tom will tell us about that next in his forecast. And later, a new movie with three big stars and a plot that you, poses an interesting question. It's part of Roy Leonard's weekend entertainment preview. For one night with your wife. Hit an above normal temperature again today, and yes, it is lightning you're seeing in parts of the area. The satellite shows what's been going on. We had showers from these clouds, but notice the hole that opens up out here, allowing temperatures to warm to the mid and upper 60s in the western part of the state. And as the cold front, this batch of clouds here is shown pushing into that late today. Uh, we've developed some 24,000 foot top thunderstorms, which are uh, flashing rather uh, actively and brilliantly in some parts of northern Illinois tonight. There is a storm, though, down to the south, and this is going to turn the winds off the lake the next couple of days, which could have an impact on us. But let's watch tonight's thunderstorms gather in a line right here along a bit of a cold front that will pass through toward morning. Uh, cloudiness and some showers linger behind the front at this point in time, so we may not clear right away. But there's at least hope that for the opener tomorrow for the Sox that we'll see at least a little sun late in the day. As you can see, clearing skies out to the west, and that area at this moment is not terribly cold. We've been spared a big rain by powerful and even deadly uh, thunderstorms and tornadoes down in the south. There's flooding for inch rains. Look at the bright thunderstorm clusters there. This is a storm system starting to form, and as it swings northeastward, the winds are going to turn around to the northeast here in Chicago starting late tomorrow, uh, more so tomorrow night and Saturday, and of course, northeast winds running down the 39-degree lake waters mean we're going to turn cooler, and then another storm will slide in, be in this position by late in the day Saturday, about ready to rain on us for Easter Sunday. That's a little bit of a change in the reasoning and the timing on all this, but here's the upper air tonight. See why we're warm? Flow comes up from the Gulf, but as this system lifts out, looks like a vigorous rain system will develop just east of us, and then a 130-mile-an-hour jet stream roars in off the Pacific and sits like this three days from now by the time we get to Easter Sunday morning. When you're on the nose of that jet, as we will be in the Midwest, the air is lifted, and that could make some rain. Look at this storm uh, lined up behind another one swirling vigorously off the West Coast, and then another one making contact with the West Coast. This is the one that uh, has given us uh, showers today. The violent weather down south. Here's the one that slides on shore right here uh, and comes at us for Easter Sunday. So w depending on what that does, that's going to have a big impact on our Easter weekend. 59 today, and look at the way we've climbed the stairs temperature-wise over the last week. The normal high is uh, 56, and we were above that today. Well, there will be some scattered thunderstorms tonight, and there will be some showers uh, into the morning hours tomorrow, hopefully to let up after the early afternoon. Look at tomorrow's highs in the 50s, lowering to 40s late in the day near the lake, but 80s down here in the southern Midwest. Two weather systems to affect us. This one we feared would come in late in the week and bring rain. It looks like it'll slide just east of us tomorrow, tomorrow night and Saturday. But the next one comes in like this and brings us some rain uh, late Easter Sunday. So the two weather systems we watch. And then next week, it could really get chilly. Big high pressure to build in Canada, turning winds off the lake. And by Tuesday next week, we'll be running more than 12 degrees below the norm. That's why our seven-day temperatures stay subnormal throughout the period. And we do bring that Easter Sunday and part of Monday rain in the area. Still mild tonight, and we'll wake up to mild weather tomorrow morning, mid and upper 50s, and winds blowing in from the south tonight. Well, showers and scattered thunderstorms, breezy, mild tonight, low temperatures down to 52, and south-southwest winds at 10 to 22. 
tomorrow, overcast and sprinkly. In fact, there may be some lingering showers in the morning, but some clearing could occur late in the day and turning cooler at that time. We'll have a high of 55, uh, and then temperatures fall off, uh, especially near the lake and in the afternoon. Northwest to north winds by evening at 6 to 18. Tomorrow night, uh, clears early, but clouds up again before sunup Saturday morning. Breezy, cooler, and mid-30s tomorrow night with a north-northeast wind. And Saturday, cloudy periods. This will be of the low variety, breezy, cooler, uh, especially near the lake. A high of only 40, 41 in that neighborhood on the lake shore, while it hits 52 out in the suburbs, where there's at least a fighting chance of a couple of periods of sun mixed in. <laughs> then Easter Sunday, we turn cloudy and rainy again and cool and in the 40s which is a little chilly for a time of the year when you see yeah. mid and upper 50s. Sounds like April. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? I can't quite make up its mind what it wants to do. Next month. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, thanks, Tom. Coming up, another chance for some Sears catalog stores. Also, you'll be digging deeper into your wallet to fill up your tank. Our business report is next. And later, nine years ago, he couldn't speak English. Now he's on his way to Washington to show off his spelling skills. Tonight, they were targeted for closing, but now some former Sears catalog stores are getting a new lease on life. 2,000 stores nationwide are affected by the retail giant's recent decision to completely pull out of the catalog business. But Sears now is saying it will convert about 350 of those catalog stores into small retail outlets. They'll carry major home appliances, consumer electronics, and lawn equipment. Sears, as you may know, is the nation's second largest retailer. Today, the company reported a 1.4% drop in same, so, uh, same store sales for the month of March. Walmart, the largest retailer, reported a 3% increase in sales. Number three, Kmart, was down 1.3%. Retail sales overall, analysts say, were held down due to that big East Coast snowstorm and lingering consumer caution. You'll be paying more at the pump this Easter holiday weekend. The Chicago Motor Club says gas prices are about four and a half cents a gallon higher than they were one month ago. And gas prices are over 10 cents a gallon higher than a year ago and more price increases are expected. Higher prices for gasoline contributed to a four-tenths of one percent increase in wholesale prices last month, the third straight increase. Some economists are saying the best news on inflation is over. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones average lost half a point in heavy trading. The stock market will be closed tomorrow for Good Friday. Rick? Well, the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery is having problems with two onboard ozone monitors, but NASA says it still will get all of the critical data that it needs. The orbiter turned night into day as it roared into orbit early this morning. Five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition. We have liftoff of Discovery on the second mission to Planet Earth research flight. The trajectory of the shuttle's climb to a northern orbit took it up the east coast. That made it visible in the night sky as far north as New York. Once in space, the crew found they could not send ozone measurements back to Earth receiving stations, but they say a backup system on board will be able to store the most crucial data, and they'll bring it back by hand. The eight-day mission will focus on looking for a hole in the ozone layer over the North Pole. I always love seeing the takeoff. That's off. great stuff. And coming up in Health Beat, do vitamins really help? Plus, a way to reduce the fear of getting a shot. Our Health Beat report is next. Health Beat tonight, Americans shell out a whopping $3 billion a year on vitamins, cash that may just be going down the tubes. After 13 years of research, a study by the Centers for Disease Control has found that taking vitamins does not make you live longer. And researchers also found no real health benefits from vitamins. The study followed 10,000 men and women between 25 and 74 years old. Well, nobody likes to get a shot, but now there's a way at least to take out some of the sting. For those who are about to get an inoculation, there is now a new topical anesthetic. It's a cream called Emla. It's available by prescription. The doctor or nurse applies a small amount of cream to the target area just like that and researchers say it reduces the pain of the actual shot that's what I want the next mm -hmm. time I get a shot help you can count on it <laughs> <laughs> this isn't healthy sports update Dan though hey call it whatever you want I don't care uh, Brian Shaw one of the least likely players to break this NBA record appeared in 54 games for Miami this season made exactly six three-point field goals until tonight. Tonight, Brian Shaw was the best three-point shooter in league history. He put down ten of them. The old record was nine by Dale Ellis and Michael Adams. Brian Shaw, the top gun in basketball tonight, and a big win for the Heat, 
who are trying desperately to hang on to a playoff spot. Now the baseball record tonight. Carlos Baerga, the Indian star second baseman. Seventh inning, way back to left and out as Cleveland was in the process of hammering the Yankees. Later on, same inning, Baerga batting left-handed, and there it goes again. It's never, ever happened in the big leagues before. One player, two homers, both sides of the plate. Same inning. Baerga signed a big contract this week, and I'm sure they think he's worth it tonight. It looks more and more like Joe Montana might be playing in Kansas City this fall. Went through a successful workout in KC today. The Chiefs like him, and Montana says he'd love to play for them. And some headlines in high school hoops today. First off, uh, most of the top players in the country are in Chicago this week for Saturday's Nike Sun-Times All-Star Game. Thomas Hamilton of King and star North Carolina recruit Jerry Stackhouse there. Carolina made some news today by signing the best high school player in America, Rashid. Wallace of Philly. And it was a hard decision, but I finally made it, and I'm a Tar Heel man. It wasn't news to me. I knew it, but um, I'm really glad he's coming, and hopefully in the next three or four years, we can build a dynasty there. I'd say they've got one in the making right now. Mm -hmm. And some good news on another Chicago high school student. They're tough enough to pronounce, let alone spell, but tricky words are no match for one Chicago team. 15-year-old Safan Kian grabbed the gold today in the 1993 Chicago Tribune Spelling Bee City Championship, but it wasn't easy. It took two grueling hours with some tough competition from 20 other teams. Queen's winning word, cuisine. The North Side teen is a native of Cambodia. His family fled the country just nine years ago. Keen will now represent Chicago in the National Spelling Bee in Washington, D.C. this summer. Good luck and to you. Oh, you betcha. When we return, Roy Leonard's weekend, P-R-E-V-I-E-W. <laughs> <laughs> And sees the premiere of an already much talked about new movie, plus a variety of live entertainment in this neck of the woods. Here is Roy Leonard with his weekend preview. The Chinese National Acrobatic Circus is in town at the Opera House. 48 outstanding performers will present their amazing acrobatics, multicolored costumes, and exotic sounds through Sunday. That's at the Opera House. Accompanied by a 55-piece symphony orchestra, the stars of Star Trek, the next generation, bring an unusual show to the Chicago Theater on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. Every good boy deserves favor, explores the problems of political dissidents, and it features the talents of Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frakes, and Brent Spiner. This play for actors and orchestra was written by Andre Previn and Tom Stoppard. Well, at the movies this week, Sandlot is just another in those mindless Hollywood excursions into what some scriptwriter perceives as the adolescent world of growing up. This one is set on and around the baseball playing field, and it's about as silly and unrealistic as you can imagine. Would you mind lending me your wife? Excuse me? For luck. Robert Redford means it when he asks Woody Harrelson if he can borrow to be more. Now, of course, he goes farther than that when he offers the young, financially troubled couple a million dollars if Demi will spend the night with him. The much-talked-about film, Indecent Proposal, doesn't really offer much for the mind, but it is a stylish picture to look at. There's just no way that a story with this premise is going to come to a satisfactory conclusion Besides that, even though it's a stylish-looking movie, Indecent Proposal starts to run out of steam the minute the big decision is made, and then it's just downhill the rest of the way. I'm Roy Leonard. Don't care. I still can't wait to see it. That's our news for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Payne. I'm Rick Rosenthal. We'll see you again tomorrow night for the 9 o'clock news. Good night.